we'll get started this afternoon with a panel on the corporate duty of care and human rights due diligence. Um, we've got a great set of speakers here today to talk about the practical implementation of the theory that we've been talking about this morning. To give just a little bit of background, um, my name is Paige Morrow, I'm from Frank Bold. We were one of the research partners for this, or, uh, for this project. We are a public interest law firm based here in Brussels as well as across Eastern Europe in the Czech Republic and Poland using a combination of for-profit and non-profit solutions to tackle issues in environmental law and human rights. We are um, talking now about human rights due diligence. And there's a lot of questions about what that actually means in practice. The UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, um, the framework gives uh, sort of a, a brief definition. They talk about an ongoing risk management process in order to identify, prevent, mitigate, and account for how a company addresses its adverse human rights impacts. And it outlines four key steps to make that happen. So first is about assessing actual and potential human rights impacts. Secondly, is about integrating and acting on those findings. Third, tracking responses. And then finally, communicating about how impacts are addressed. So the key here is that there's this constant feedback around implementing, uh, monitoring, and evaluating how uh, due diligence processes are being done in practice. We know that business has a differentiated but complementary responsibility to that of states in preventing and addressing corporate human rights impacts. So when states enact their human rights laws, corporations have a legal obligation to comply with them. Additionally, there's a social responsibility to respect human rights. And that is where the UN Guiding Principles uh, and the framework have given us a global standard about expected co corporate impact or corporate conduct regarding human rights. The issues of human rights are risk to business. So we've got a variety of issues. Um, of course, there's uh, legal risk. We talked a lot this morning about corporate liability. There's also reputational damage. There's loss of uh, brand and uh, market share as, res as a result. And there's also increasing pressure from investors to respond um, res and adequately respond to human rights issues. The, these are, of course, context specific. And that's why it's interesting to hear from companies about how they're actually implementing this. And Coca-Cola will talk a little bit about how they've been doing that in practice because they, of course, have global supply chains which are particularly complex and have been publicly criticized and have had to respond to those criticisms and, and implement um, guidelines both within their own operations and for those of their suppliers and contractors in terms of reducing their legal, operational, and reputational risk. To go back to the research report, in part four, we address the intersection between the corporate responsibility to respect human rights and tort law. There were three options there for legal reform for respecting human rights that were discussed. Um, the first was about disclosure obligations in civil law procedure, i.e. continental Europe, with respect to the defendant company's control over business partners. So that could be either subsidiaries or contractual partners. Um, and this is really about once a claim has been launched. The second option is again for where there's already a court case that's been commenced. It's about burden of proof. There the potential reform would be to assume an existence of control over business partners, again, either subsidiaries or contractual partners, when certain criteria are met that show def prima facie, meaning um, a presumption of control. The third, the third option, which is what we're going to talk about here this afternoon, is about introducing a company duty to identify, prevent, and take action to end human rights abuses by business partners, again, subsidiaries or contractors, which are analogous to the human rights due diligence described in the UN Guiding Principle Framework, which I outlined at the beginning. The, so there has been some discussion of this um, in France in particular, has a draft law on... Um, on implementing human rights due diligence. There's also been discussion at the EU level, and we're very fortunate to have the policy advisor to the group that has been working on that here. Um, without further ado, I'm gonna just explain who the panelists are, and they will get up each individually to sort of talk a little bit about their, about their work in this area. And then I really encourage you to make sure that this is a vibrant debate and, and have questions, because we will be able to open it up to the floor for, uh, for discussion. 
So first we have Alice Pedretti from um, CSR Europe, who has been a project manager who's focused very much on their blueprint for uh, embedding human rights and company functions. And this guidance has been providing practical support to companies, particularly for procurement, risk or legal and human resources functions within the company on how to actually practically implement human rights across the organization. So she's going to talk a little bit about how that's been developed and how they're working with companies to put that in practice. Uh, we also have uh, Ben from Uni Global, who is an expert in supply chains. And he's going to talk a little bit about the groundbreaking Bangladesh Accord on fire and building safety, which has been implemented to address Rana Plaza um, and to try to prevent uh, future I issues. Then um, we have, we're very fortunate to have uh, Peter from Coca-Cola, who's going to talk about how they've been um, about how, they, how they've been implementing human rights due diligence across their supply chains, as I mentioned, but also more specifically, they've adopted a zero land grabbing policy. This is an incredibly complex issue. It involves a multi-step process for identifying uh, where there could be land rights that are infringed, and so he's gonna talk a little bit about um, how that's been done and, and how they're reporting on it to their stakeholders. And finally, but not least, we have uh, Francesco Agnello from European Parliament, who is an advisor to the EFDD group. Um, and they have prepared an own initiative report on corporate liability, which has been, it's going up for a plenary vote in October. And he's gonna talk to us about what's in their, uh, in their report. So, Alice, if you can start us off. Thank you, Paige, and please stop me when the 10 minutes are uh, due. And good afternoon, everybody. Um, um, yeah, I'm Alice Pedretti from CSR Europe. We are a business network for corporate social responsibility. I see some familiar faces, so I'm sure that some of you already know the organization. Uh, we have been working on uh, this uh, blueprint uh, for, uh, well, for quite some time, and we launched it recently um, in March here in Brussels. And um, we discussed with Paige to give a bit of uh, context to this discussion on, on human rights due diligence and, and uh, embedding human rights in general in, in organizations. And, and I agree very much with you, Paige, on, on the uh, elements of due diligence, but I would also add the element of policy. So you need a policy commitment and also operational policies on how to implement uh, those commitments. And also you need to um, remediate, to provide remediation, meaning also to integrate the learnings that come out through the due diligence and, and, and try to implement them or try to improve the processes and the policies to avoid negative impacts in the future. Um, I, I wanted to uh, focus the attention on the elements that we have uh, identified for companies to embed human rights in company functions. First of all, uh, we base that not on our assumptions, but we base our work and, and, and uh, the elements I will mention now on the guiding principle. The guiding principle provides a very clear, yet theoretical, um, uh, definition of what embedding means for companies. And we try to, through interviews with companies and working with an expert, to translate them into uh, elements that companies will, can consider to improve their uh, practices. The first one is cross-functional leadership, meaning you need commitment from the top, but not only from the sustainability function, let's say, not only from the head of sustainability, but from the different departments and, and ideally from all and for the board of directors. Uh, and this will um, support the case for making sure for your entire company, your entire operations, that your company is serious about it. The second element is about shared responsibility. And here we, talk, we are talking more about the activity owners. So uh, either being in HR, in sustainability, in procurement, in sales, you need to make sure that uh, the different departments are working together. And that's not an easy task. I'm, I'm very aware of that. Um, very difficult indeed, uh, especially when we talk about big companies with operations everywhere in the world where the legal context is different everywhere, where the expectations are different everywhere. So that, that's, that's a very difficult task, but companies, I think, more and more today, and we will hear also something later uh, um, 
are working on it. The, the third element is about incentivize. And I would say this probably is the trickiest one so far um, because incentivize ethical behavior in all staff um, so beyond the board of directors or the head of the functions is, is, is very difficult, but we have uh, seen in, in the work with companies some, um, some pilot projects, so things are moving slowly, five years after the uh, endorsement of the guiding principles. And, um, and, and what we saw is that the procurement function is talking about due diligence also is a bit more advanced than other functions because often the procurement managers are um, or their performance is linked to the performance of suppliers against code of conduct so you have more clear um, benchmark that you can do but for other function is still more difficult uh, hr function a little bit also uh, improving on the incentivized systems because you can link the performance to for example how many uh, people have been trained on human rights and 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 um, or in which locations but when we go beyond these examples the practice is very weak, so further work needs to be needs to be done. The, the uh, fourth element that we have identified is provide operational guidance and training. And training, and and here the key elements are two. So first of all, operational guidance. So not only training. So you do one hour, two hours, X hours of training, but also something written or something uh, a tool that will help any employee, any person of the staff to be able to go back and say and check, okay, this is how I should do and let help them not only think but act beyond the training. And um, and I think what is important here is not to underline the fact that it's not only about internal trainings of the employees. And when we talk about this, we also have to consider that tailored training is fundamental. So tailor the content to the to your audience or to the context, to the country, but also uh, train your supply chain, so your suppliers. And here, one element that we see in our work that is growing more and more, I was talking with Peter about this uh, earlier, uh, is sector collaboration. So don't do this by yourself, but take advantage of industry, industry association that more and more are working on it, not only to uh, conduct due diligence, so you also cut the cost, it's very effective, but also to build capacity along the supply chain. And, and I think this is a key element if really we want to drive an impact that is beyond the, what we communicate in the uh, sustainability report. Uh, the last two elements uh, are about um, communicate what you do. So not only communicate externally, but here I'm talking about internal communication. And what is important is that Companies foster two-way communications, we called it. So top-down, in terms of policies, in terms of training, in terms of any other uh, tools. There are companies in, in our network that, for example, have um, a, a web TV for the employees, where the CEO, uh, on a monthly basis, um, re record an, an interview on a different aspect on human rights, sustainability, and so on. And this helps the staff also familiarize with the discussion but also bottom up. And here the due diligence is actually a tool that you can use or impact assessment are tools that you can use to, as a way to, um, to have a clear picture of what's happening at local level. So two-way communication is very important. And last but not least, linked to what uh, Paige, Paige said at the beginning, is review, analyze, and integrate. So once you do your monitor and your check, uh, you also need to establish a system, a systematic way to integrate those learnings. And this is also very complicated. Uh, but one, one important element to, to consider, I think, it's to try to move from what is happening right now very often, I would say, that companies uh, identify a specific human rights issue and based on that, they develop an improvement plan, which is great, which is great. But it would be better to, um, to, to, how can I say this? To move from the ad hoc basis approach to a more systematic approach. And, and um, 
And I have an example that I, I wrote down because I think it's a, a great example from uh, an employment and a recruitment agency in our network. Um, and they have this uh, Mr. Guest system. So it's to uh, check the, uh, the implementation of the anti-discrimination policy. Um, they have a Mr. Guest, so it's a third party external to the company that go to the branch and uh, check how the implementation of this anti-discrimination policy is done. And the result of this is um, there is no shaming if things are not done properly, but they use the learning or they use the finding uh, to improve the training for that specific location or for that specific country. So this is a very simple example as well if you want to show how the revision is linked to the integration of learnings. So these are the six examples that we uh, have identified. And... Um, and I think I will stop here and maybe I will discuss the challenges later on. Thank you. Um, good morning or um, almost good lunch. I, <laughs> timing wise, we're approaching there. Um, so my name is uh, Ben van Peperstraten. I'm a joint employee of uh, Uni Global Union and Industrial Global Union. So two global unions who represent unions uh, in the service sector, that's Uni, and in uh, manufacturing, mining, uh, and energy, that's industrial. So we well, my two employers together represent workers, for example, in factories in Bangladesh, but they also represent workers in the stores of clothing retailers here in Brussels. And, well, I have the specific honor of being an employee for both and to work specifically on those supply chain issues of what's happening in the factories to which uh, virtually every major retailer you can find uh, both in Nieuwstraat as in Avenue Louise uh, are sourcing from. Um, practically, I do work a lot on, on Bangladesh and uh, also on Pakistan. Um, I've worked on uh, the Rana Plaza arrangement that was mentioned uh, in uh, the morning, uh, in the introduction, uh, which provided compensation for loss of income to uh, the victims of uh, Rana Plaza. But I also do work on the Bangladesh Accord. And for the purpose of this uh, session which talks about uh, due diligence, I think mainly um, or work around the accord uh, can actually be uh, highly informative uh, of a broader discussion uh, to do due diligence. I think it was already mentioned, we, we are now living really in a different era when it comes to due diligence because we are in what I refer always to as the post ruggy era. We have those guiding principles and they, they are extremely useful, uh, although I my constituents would have uh, preferred a more binding instrument at that juncture in time. It's still extremely useful because it does clarify an enormous amount of things. It does clarify um, that uh, even when uh, host countries, when specific countries I, who have still the prime responsibility to, um, to uh, enact human rights, if, if that's not happening, that companies can no longer hide behind that. And on that second... Um, responsibility of companies is, is something that we think Ruggy has really helped shifting the debate in a very productive uh, sense. And I think the debate for a lot of companies, a lot of organizations, as well as uh, us as unions, is also then to see how can we then uh, render that into practice. Um, and, and we see that that's, that shift, that mental, uh, that, that seismic shift almost, uh, is not always um, very understood and for a lot of, of, of companies, a lot of professionals are still in the process of seeing what does that mean to us. I, we still see companies talking about, oh, but we've got a code of conduct, but actually Ruggie is quite clear about it. It's about all human rights, so the formulation of a code of conduct no longer has the same value that it had before Ruggie. I'm, still, I'm not saying that it can't be useful because it can be extremely useful in getting that policy commitment, but the function is totally different and so the thinking is totally different. And what we do see is that a lot of, of, of companies are also then still struggling. How do we do that due diligence? So we think that um, with the Bangladesh Accord we, we, we found a number of, of very practical yet political solutions uh, to some of those challenges that companies uh, are facing. 
Um, but may, maybe let's start with why we had that Bangladesh Accord. That, that obviously was uh, an agreement that we reached with 215 companies ranging from very big to very small in the wake of Rana Plaza. But it's also built on an agreement that we tried to sell already for two years. Uh, because the, the, the risk in itself, buildings collapp collapsing and burning down with lethal consequences, was not new. It was always there. It was already known for 10 years in that specific region of the world, um, which I think already brings to a first uh, lesson, uh, which I believe has not always been understood by the, the, um, the everybody within a corporate structure, is, is when we talk about risk-based due diligence, to whom is the risk? <laughs> is that a risk to the company itself, or is that the human rights risk? And there, there we see a lot of conceptual and uh, operational uh, confusion, which uh, I think is, is very well demonstrated in the case of Bangladesh, because everybody knew that fire and building safety is a risk. It, is, it has legal consequences, so there's clear human rights risks. Yet, at the same time, uh, we didn't see in the lead-up to Rana Plaza any, or any major improvements in uh, the classical uh, due diligence strategies of companies. They still went to look with uh, classical social audit reports, which are deficient in a number of ways. Uh, they under-detect, they under-report, and it's very unclear what the follow-up is in terms of remedy once a, a, a report would find something. Uh, once they would uh, uh, also report it, it's still unclear what is actually then the specific follow-up. And that's not to be surprised because um, basically a lot of, of, of companies are still working on a model that they, ask, they pay somebody to police themselves, which does have a lot of fundamental um, conflicts of interest. I, I can't call it otherwise. Um, so then bringing to why that Bangladesh Accord is innovative is, well, first of all, it's a binding agreement between us and those 250 companies. So that policy commitment is already there. It's signed off by a CEO or by a chairman. So I, that's, that's indeed necessary to have a high level signature on something to empower uh, the human rights team or the corporate responsibility team to work on it. But then we also start doing inspections under that joint agreement. So it's no longer companies policing themselves and we then afterwards could comment or criticize on it. No, it's we develop a robust, credible system of inspections. And for a lot of factories this in Bangladesh, this was actually the first time that a competent engineer would set foot in those factories and start assessing whether or not fire doors are really fire doors or just red doors that people assume are fire doors or whether structural integrity is really as in the plans or as built and, and so forth. So that's, I think, the first thing that we, we did in that agreement, which, was, which sounds very practical, but which was a huge, uh, is a huge shift to go and have credible inspection, which is, I think, really also the first step of due diligence. Going in those factories, going to your suppliers, going to your partners, and see what's happening there. And then, on the basis of what you find, also start acting. So once those inspections go there, we put them in reports with mandatory time schedules, like, oh, we've seen that the foundation can't support eight stories of a building. Well, you need to reinforce that foundation, and you need to do it by then. Um, and what we do is we put it all on the internet. There is a website which has all the suppliers listed with nicely every inspection report with photos in Bangla so workers can understand also what's happening, can also say there is an underreporting here. Um, and the corrective actions are also listed on the website. Um, so that, I think that's a, a second step, um, which if you read the structure of the guiding principles is often much more at the end of the process, but I think it's also part of the process to be transparent to everybody who has a stake here, including in the case of work, uh, those factories, the workers. Um, so everybody can see these factories are covered, this needs to be happening, is that happening? So that's, that helps to generate a whole set of accountability. So afterwards we do come back to those factories and come back to exactly the same thing. So well, last time there was no fire door, what's happening with that fire door? And what you then notice, and I think that's very telling, is that you do see a culture of um, uh, factory owners who are used to have um, CSR people to whom they could quite easily say, yeah, yeah, don't worry, it's coming, it's in the high seas. Um, 
it's on its way, it will come. But after a while, because you always insist on exactly the same thing in a very transparent and open way, those excuses become more and more silly. And we need to move to something else. And I think that's then the other element that um, I think is so innovative about uh, the agreement that we struck in uh, the Bangladesh Accord is that the companies who source from those factories have not only the obligation to say, okay, with this credible inspection regime, we're going to check out what's happening, we're going to help to fix it. But if it's not fixing, if, if that's not happening, we have a stick and a carrot. The sti I, let's start with the carrot, that's always easier. The companies commit to financing if that is needed. Because our theory is that companies in their sourcing policies, uh, well, you were saying about reward system in procurement, often it's also about on the margin you generate, so the lower prices you can make uh, with your suppliers. Well, at a given moment, the price can no longer go lower without really cutting on costs that are related uh, with safeguarding human rights. You cannot cut at a given moment on the, the, the price of cloth anymore. So you need to look at where can we squeeze it out, and that's often the labor cost. And yeah, you need to put a ceiling on that. So that's where the financial commitment comes in. Um, so there is uh, a carrot, but at the same time, there's also a stick. So if factories refuse or continue to refuse doing things, well, at a given moment, companies need to also say, well, our values between you as supplier and us as a company no longer match. And I'm sorry, we can no longer do business together. So I think that's the carrot. So companies also have the obligation if, if progress is stalled and there is no prospect anymore, that I took a ties. And what I think then helps with the accord, given that we have those 215 companies, is that we do that collectively. Because a lot of those factories are in supply chains of different companies. They're the same factories, they're the same issues, they're the same risks, but different companies. Which also, I think, brings to an appeal to uh, what you mentioned, that a, a number of these risk assessments and, and dealing with the risks and, and, and preventing, mitigating, and providing remedy is also a discussion that needs to happen sometimes between competitors at a sector level. And I think that discussion is also now more and more um, available through, for example, uh, the agreement uh, that we work on. So I think that's in a nutshell uh, the Bangladesh Accord to which we're extremely proud. Um, but I try to sort of uh, give also some incentives or some ideas on what could be generalized into um, uh, a, a more generalized praxis on how do we do uh, human rights uh, due diligence uh, in supply chains. Um, I think the last and final remark is, again, still that it's an agreement with us as labor. Um, and we're sort of in that the watchdog. So it's a contractual agreement. If we feel that the brands are not living up to their commitment, well, then we have avenues for a serious discussion because there is an arbitration clause to the agreement as such. And I think that's also not to be underestimated because it does shift the internal discussion within a company about what is needed. And in a certain sense, you can't really bargain with human rights and what is feasible. Whereas beforehand, maybe in the same co uh, company, that discussion was much more uh, freely done. Like, oh yeah, I, but this we can't do, this we can't do, because it will cut production. Whereas now the discussion is also much more, no, no we've got a hard obligation, which actually human rights should be. Um, and we, we need to find a way to live up to that. So in some, I think with the accord, uh, we're making, um, very tangible, concrete steps in, in operationalizing, okay, what do we then mean under the guiding principles with going to factories, checking out what's happening, preventing or mitigating issues, and then uh, securing that that also remains as such. Uh, if there's any more questions afterwards, uh, happy to uh, answer them. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is uh, Pietje Beuze. Do I need to move up the mic a bit? <laughs> okay. Uh, so 
I'm working for the Coca-Cola company. Now, um, one of the um, easiness of uh, when you tell you're working for Coca-Cola is a lot of people know our product. But what they don't know is how our system is composed. In fact, I'm working for the Coca-Cola company. This is a franchise system. So we own the brand. We make what we call the magical secret syrup. And then we sell it on to independent bottlers around the world. And they, um, that has permitted the Coca-Cola company to become so big and, and multinational that they only started their expansion, in fact, after the Second World War, because most of the workers, most of the capital, most of the production facilities, etc., are in our franchise system. Now, in the Western world, those at the time, they were family-owned businesses. In Belgium, for example, you had 14 different independent bottlers. They have taken over one another and they have been consolidated and they became more and more also multinational companies. Um, so it's franchise, meaning that from a supply chain standpoint of view, I'll come back on that, that it's not always so easy to control everything. Um, personally, I am working for the Coca-Cola system since uh, we were asking 22 years. I have a uh, legal background. I, have, I did different things. I'm ba I happen to be based in Brussels. Um, and since, let's say, the last 10 years, HR has always been one of my passion as a lawyer. And I was dealing a lot with the European Works Council issues for the Coca-Cola system. And that's how last summer uh, I was asked to extend a little bit my responsibilities and also become part of what we call the global workplace rights team in the Coca-Cola company. So my boss is Brent Wilton, who some of you know was working for the Employers Association, International Employers Association in Geneva for the last 12 years. Uh, and so this is a new space for me, but quite in interesting because it's in the extension of what I was doing before. Um, what, just some reflections on my first year observing in this world is how do we as a, a multinational company, how do we um, look at our supply chain? The question really when you talk about due diligence is how deep do you go into your supply chain? Upstream, downstream, and you see for example ours is a lot in the agricultural products that we are buying but not directly, I mean, this is through different uh, partners. So that's the first question you need to ask yourself. How deep do you want to understand your supply chain? I think what definitely adds to this um, uh, is the, the, the way that multinational companies are forced, be it through legislation, through um, uh, share owners pressure through some legislative in, in the corporate world to, to report and benchmark. I mean, they are, we are compared to other multinational companies and that is obviously adding uh, to the expectation that due diligence is being used and will lead also to deeper into our supply chain. Uh, how we did as the Coca-Cola company, we identified in fact 10 major commodities. Um, and we are going to the farm to know what's going on and if something goes wrong, we want to remediate that if necessary. Um, why is that also important? Consumers' expectation, and I see that with my children and, 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 and the younger generation, but consumers' expectation in general is growing in terms of their interests and in where do products come from. Um, and how they are produced. You see that in, in our mobile phones, you see that in the garment industry, but you see that a lot in, uh, not yet in all sectors uh, or geographies, uh, but I think that can be expected much more over time. So it's important again for us to invest in that. It's obviously also driven by, uh, due diligence also driven by public commitments that we are making, um, our share, um, how would I say, our CEO is making a commitment uh, related to environmental impact of our business. I mean, then we need to make sure that the facts are true on the statement he's making or he's saying um, by 2020, 
you see that a lot. We will achieve this, this, and that, and then we, all the system needs to turn around to make sure that we come there. Um, two examples you asked me to mention is um, one of the 10 commodities I was mentioning is sugar. I mean, we buy, obviously, globally a lot of sugar as a system, and together with Oxfam, uh, we committed that by 2020, we will do an in-depth study of 20 in 28 countries, uh, an in-depth study on that sugar um, industry and sugar supply chain, where we will mainly focus on three aspects of human rights, forced labor, child labor, and land rights, those three. And up to now, I think five studies have been done. We're very transparent. You can find them on our corporate website. They're done by independent agency. And in some of those reports, you'll see there is some remediation done. Um, what we also did recently is obviously you talk about policies. The UN Guiding Principles is talking about policy, is review our policy. So currently we have in our system the human rights policy, we call it now, and it's, it's branded like that. And then versus third parties, the supply guiding principles, where we have a goal also, again, by 2020, uh, to, to, to have a certain level of uh, due diligence done. And then two last uh, things, uh, we'll talk about that. We also have a, a policy of zero tolerance for land grabs, which mainly in the sugar industry is very important. You don't always know how the farmers are owning their lands, how they come there. Sometimes they're owned by the, by the industry themselves, sometimes by government, sometimes that's in the agricultural world very sensitive. And then the last thing, um, which is also new, I think, uh, that I saw developing, is that in the, when we do due diligence uh, of buying companies, divesting companies, so in the merger and acquisition world, human rights is becoming an important section. So you do a lot of environmental due diligence, financial due diligence, etc. but human rights and um, human resources in general has become more and more important in that field. And in the interest of time, I suggest we stop there and then we'll continue our dialogue. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Francesco Agnello. Uh, first of all, I would like to Thank you, the organizer, for the kind invitation. To thank uh, Katerina, of course. And um, I am very happy to have the opportunity to uh, address you uh, today. And uh, above all, I am very happy to have the opportunity to, to listen to uh, the very interesting words of the uh, speakers that took the floor before me. Um, well, uh, Apparently, I have the most complicated task today, not because of the, of the topic I will address, of course, but because after me will follow lunch. So everybody now expects that I be very brief, and uh, I want to meet your expectation, of course. Um, the, uh, I, I am here because, as an advisor, I uh, dealt with a um, report on corporate liability, the European Parliament. And um, I would like to explain more or less what is continuing this report that at this, uh, the present has not been yet approved in the plenary. Uh, my, uh, well, let's say, we start working on the report in November. Uh, it's been a, it has been a very complicated task because it's a very sensitive issue and uh, the, the um, the other political groups, every single other political groups have priority uh, that uh, were different one from each other. It's not mine, but in any case. <laughs> and uh, um, it was a very complicated, uh, uh, um, very complicated uh, uh, way negotiation. Uh, but uh, at the end, we succeed, and the report passed at the um, AFET committee uh, on the 17th, on the 12th of July. Um, well, uh, first of all, uh, the uh, the guidelines that we followed in working at this at this report: uh, cooperation among political groups, 
we are a very small political group, so uh, very small political group, so we need uh, you know cooperation and feedback by other political groups. But uh, we think that is also a, a, a good way uh, to work uh, in the European Parliament to put together uh, all the ideas, all the priority, and then try to work. Uh, the better report on this topic. And uh, we were very uh, lucky to find uh, the same uh, aptitudes by the other uh, shadow rapporteurs, the other political groups. Uh, second, uh, attention to civil society. We devoted several uh, meetings uh, to uh, listen, uh, to read, to receive input from uh, civil society, NGOs, and, and this has been really important for us, very useful. Uh, what were the aims of the rapporteur, uh, Mr. Corrao, of, of the FDD group? Uh, he puts on the floor uh, in a very clear way uh, which were its aims. Effectiveness. Uh, we don't need uh, other words saying that human rights are important, that uh, we are in favor of human rights protection and so on. We need something that is effective. Uh, secondly, to address all corporations, European and not European corporations. Uh, and then the attention for access to remedies. Um, the draft has been presented in March 2016. Uh, was a, a draft, uh, a short draft, you know, we have limits in our a number of words and so on. Uh, but this draft came from this debate. So uh, we had very clear what to put in this first draft. And uh, actually, we did a very strong uh, first draft. And we expected a lot of amendments. And in fact, 257 amendments came from, other, from the other groups. Uh, but uh, I, I have to say that. Uh, a good percentage among these amendments were friendly amendments, uh, a, amendments that uh, seek to uh, ameliorate the test. And then the uh, follow phases was negotiation. Negotiation in order to find what we call compromises amendments. We try to put together different amendments coming from different groups in order to find a solution that could be approved by the majority of the groups. Uh, we met several times with the other groups and we, uh, at the end, we found 35 um, compromises amendments. And most of the 257 amendments have been withdrawn, practically or uh, formally. Um, and the report has been voted uh, on the uh, 12th of July in AFET, because the Human Rights Committee is a subcommittee of the Foreign Affairs Committee. So the, the vote for reports uh, uh, to take place in the AFET. And uh, the result was impressive because we had 62 positive votes, 62 votes in favor, five votes <coughs> against, and one abstention. Uh, that means that given that we had less than 10% of votes against, uh, the report should be uh, approved uh, at the plenary section of October without discussion and without the possibility to make new amendments well, in principle, uh, groups can ask and reopen this deadline. Um, well, but let's go to the, to the content. Uh, first of all, the title. The title is Corporate Liability for Serious Human Rights Abuses in Third Countries. Uh, serious and third countries can, um, well, can, can, uh, be, can attract our attention. Of course, this is the title, but we, uh, do in, the, in the body of the, of the report, we, uh, add no, we have no distinction among serious and not serious human rights violation. Uh, we, de we deal with human rights violation. Why in third countries? Because as I told you, uh, um, this uh, report has been adopted in the uh, subcommittee uh, of human rights that work in the framework of the AFET Committee for Foreign Affairs. So our competences uh, deal uh, just with human rights violation abuses in third countries. Um, we have to keep this in mind when reading the report. In fact, we focused on uh, human rights violation in third countries. Uh, so uh, the report does not contain any uh, reference um, on uh, problems of jurisdiction, of, of burden of proof, and everything that is 
inside the European Union. So conflicts are low among countries that are member states of the European Union uh, is not uh, uh, afforded in the report. Um, well, uh, the report is divided in six sections. The first one deals with cooperation and human rights. It's an introductory section, the first three paragraphs. Then we have a consideration on the international framework, paragraph four and five. And then we have other four sections that are more, uh, go more to the substance of the problem, to the core uh, issues. Uh, there's the calls addressed to the corporation and their duty to respect human rights, paragraph six to 11. Calls addressed to member states and their duty to protect human rights, paragraphs 12 to 23. And access to effective remedies, paragraphs 24, 25, and 26. And call addressed to the Commission, 27 to 39. Uh, I think I can be uh, very quick in dealing with the first. Uh, section, but I would like to focus more on the uh, session devoted to access to effective remedies. Um, well, the first two sections are more introductive. Uh, the reports uh, start considering globalization, advances in technology, problems related with supply chains, and the need uh, to act in a continuous, effective, and co coherent manner at all levels. This is why we call member states, European Union, we consider the international framework. Uh, the second session welcomes the UNGPs, um, ask for worldwide implementation, call company to implement uh, the same principle, the OECD principle, etc. Uh, and we make reference to the UN Global Compact, ISO 2006, uh, 26000 and uh, other uh, issues that are being adopted, other, other instruments, tools that are being adopted at the uh, international level. Uh, then we focus on uh, uh, the corporation and their duty to respect human rights. Um, we try to make very clear that it's not an issue of charity. Uh, international corporation have to respect human rights, they have a duty as the all uh, actors in, uh, in the national and international uh, legal uh, system, they have to respect uh, human rights. And they have a lot of, a lot of duties that come from, from this. Um, the fourth paragraph, uh, um, is one, uh, one of the, uh, of the, uh, the fourth section is one of the most uh, interesting, I think, because deal with the state uh, duty to protect human rights. Um, we make express reference to the concept of jurisdiction, i.e. to the concept uh, that state has this duty even if these abuses take place outside its own territory, if uh, it, these abuses uh, take place into the framework of the state jurisdiction. Uh, uh, we uh, devote attention to the duty to provide access to remedy. Uh, access to remedy uh, are being dealt in a specific uh, section. Um, looking at the external relation of member states, uh, we call for policy coherence uh, in all the uh, issues that are, for example, commercial agreements. Um, and we uh, ask for uh, urgently uh, binding instruments to be adopted by states at the internal level. Uh, the word binding has been uh, strongly negotiated among groups, was one of the most critical issue, uh, as well as the reference to uh, European Union um, uh, companies and uh, third countries companies. Some groups uh, try to um, erase all the reference to the European Union state, European Union companies, looking just the violation in third countries. But of course, our aims was to deal also with uh, European uh, companies. Also, but not only. One of our aims was also to extend uh, as much as possible um, the, the borders of competence uh, of, cre of national courts to deal also with um, countries, uh, uh, with, with the companies uh, that are uh, maybe are not 
national of uh, a country, but have some linkage uh, with, uh, mm, with the uh, European Union. Uh, on this respect, I will uh, deal immediately with the section devoted to access to effective remedies. And uh, mm, for example, art, uh, paragraph 25, 25 uh, state that when a corporation based in, in the given state holds direct or control companies that are responsible for human rights violations in other countries, it should be addressed. Uh, and calls uh, the member state to take a prepared step to eliminate legal, practical, and other relevant barriers, uh, to establish appropriate procedural means to enable those affected inter countries to have access to justice in both civil and criminal courts and to pierce the veil of legal personality, among others. Uh, while Article 26 referred to uh, um, the class action, also for uh, third countries' victims. Uh, unfortunately, uh, among the unfriendly amendment that has been voted uh, in uh, the committee session, uh, two of them uh, cancelled two paragraphs that we uh, uh, felt to be really important for uh, remedies. The paragraph 27 of the draft report that uh, was calling for the establishment of a necessity forum, le forum necessitatis, uh, when some linkage, uh, sufficient attachment can be uh, found in a case with respect to a court. And article, uh, paragraph 28, that was calling for the establishment of case of jurisdiction based on the presence of the defense assets in the union. Um, as I told you, we, uh, uh, in principle, we won't have space for uh, new amendments, but of course, if the deadline will be opened by other groups, we will try to insist uh, to uh, uh, present again this kind of uh, proposal, as well as the reversal of the burden of proof that has been um, um, been mentioned by uh, some speakers before me that was present in the in the draft but has been um, cancelled during negotiation. Um, well, I, uh, I think my time is, is uh, elapsed, so I am uh, of course I'm uh, available to answer any question. Thank you. And I'll start off with a couple of questions, one or two questions for the panelists, but I encourage you to indicate when you have a question. We'll just integrate them immediately into the next section. Um, and if it's okay, Alice, I wanted to follow up with you on your discussion because you mentioned that there were some challenges of implementing the blueprint for companies. And if you might just give one or two examples of, of sort of how you've worked with companies both to identify and overcome them. Um, I already started mentioning some uh, when I talk about the incentivized part, so incentivized ethical uh, behavior or by linking uh, performance assessment to explicitly to human rights. So that's very tricky and, and it's still at its infant stage. And uh, we have seen some examples, but mostly pilots that try to see how this can be adjusted for stuff that is beyond the head. Um, the head of un uh, unit, sorry, the head of um, the functions or, or the board. And the second uh, element I also mentioned is the integration of results. So there is really uh, trying to move from this more ad hoc approach to identifying proven plans for a specific issue, which is a great, I, I, I really want to underline this, I think it's a great uh, way to, to uh, also provide speedy resolution uh, for some urgent issues, but it's also good to start uh, thinking for companies that are uh, um, incorporating more and more human rights and in different aspects of the operation and strategy, a more systematic approach to that. And, and, and the last one is um, um, to avoid this breakdown silos between, let's say, in terms of communication of these large companies with operations everywhere. Um, um, so it's important to uh, establish mechanism of, com of communication inter and intra functions. 
Um, and, and for example, we mentioned all of us actually to a certain extent grievance mechanisms and or access to remedy. And, and I think one important way, it's not legally binding, but one very effective way, if done properly actually, um, of um, addressing human rights issues uh, along the supply chain, actually along the value chain, not only the supply chain for company is non-judicial mechanisms. And, and I think that's a very important way also to, um, to, um, yeah, to be able to capture what's happening at local level and, and to address and um, and, and I strongly yeah, su support it. Uh, but I also take Ben's point on, um, on um, in terms of due diligence, when you identify uh, some issues, if these are not, uh, you provide, let's say, a certain timeline for resolution, and if it doesn't happen, you discontinue. I partly disagree on this. I understand, I understand, and, and actually this is happening, but I partly disagree because I think more and more what we have seen, uh, I'm an optimistic, maybe also that's why. Um, it's that n be try to be a little, let's say, more flexible and to uh, support the supplier, or if you're doing this collectively, the group of supplier, uh, your audience, to uh, to improve and, and use this uh, discontinuation, let's say, as a threat, but before, uh, but not really, uh, let's say, implemented because it's very, um, and I'm sorry to go back to the cost part, but I work with companies, so that's uh, something very important. It's also not very cost efficient, let's put it this way. So it's better to actually improve the performance of an existing supplier rather than find a new one and go through the process of tendering, blah, blah, blah. So that's just uh, one uh, very tricky element that I wanted to underline. Thanks. Thank you. And before we uh, go to Ben to, to reply to those comments, I just wanted to take a question from the audience and add one myself as well. Oh, um, Daniel, if you don't mind kicking us off and just introducing yourself and, um, and keeping the questions short, if you don't mind, so we can bring it back to the panel. Uh, Daniel, I'll just ask uh, Yeah, of course, sorry. Um, Daniel Augenstein, two quick questions for Ben. Um, of course, I mean, this is a remarkable achievement, the Accord, both in terms of a regulatory technique and in terms of the effects it will have on workers' protection. I just wonder, um, apart from protection, you know, normally human rights are also about empowering people. Hence my question is, the first one would be, do you know whether the Accord had any effect on strengthening the role of the traditionally, the traditionally very weak role of the national trade unions? And the second question is, to my knowledge, there's no, there are no rights conferred on the individual workers, nor do they have direct rights, nor do they have access to the arbitration procedure direct. And if that is the case, I wonder why. Thanks. And I think we have one more question at the front. Yes. Thank you. Uh, simply because I was uh, both uh, involved in the problem of due diligence as an uh, academician and uh, uh, as a consultant. So I, I'm presently finalizing with the my research group uh, work on uh, human rights due diligence. So I would like to exploit this uh, uh, audience and the, the, the rapporteurs about having some information about exactly what is the uh, topics of my, uh, the problems addressed and uh, seeing if there are opinions that can help us. Uh, the first is, uh, the first is uh, the, the due diligence of course is defined by objectives, expect, uh, uh, Every due diligence is, is, is in practice defined only by objectives, very rarely by procedures. But uh, the objective is usually to understand the, the risks. The risks, but sometimes it's a tricky question. The risk for whom? The risk for the, for the reputation of the company in question at stake, or the risk for the victim, or both. It could sound obvious, but it's not so obvious as it could uh, you could uh, see. The second uh, question, the second problem, very interesting in my opinion, is, is a due diligence a finished process, means a defined process, step by step, so something that it can be, let's say, standardized. Huh? 
as many used to do, and also myself. We, we published for, for the Italian Committee of International, uh, uh, for the Italian uh, Interministerial Committee for Human Rights, we contributed to the National Action Plan through a guidance for the small business. So in my opinion, some months ago, opinion change, of course, the, the due diligence was, to a certain extent, a finished process. But is it true? Is it really that? And very, and very, and very final question, problem. Uh, due diligence, I've been, uh, let's say, uh, uh, involved in due diligence in many countries of the world. Uh, and the due diligence in human rights is a picture or a movie? Means a picture, I mean a static description of a situation, simply to take, uh, let's say, uh, contingent measures. Or it is a movie in the sense that I have to make a more large drawing to make the company understand what could be done also in the, let's say, midterm. I'm very sorry to try to exploit you. The time perhaps is not enough, but I would like to be grateful. And of course, I fully open to share all what we will be doing. Uh, I think uh, our work to, will be uh, finished uh, at the beginning of October. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I'll uh, turn it back to Ben to respond to the questions that were addressed to him and then to if there's anyone else on the panel that would like to jump in. Yeah. Um, yeah maybe I'll start with a question very uh, specifically addressed. Um, well, at the time of, of, of uh, discussing with uh, the brand counterpart the agreement, um, there wasn't enough political capital to expand it to full freedom of association and so forth. So there is in the agreement part on uh, occupational health and safety. So we do talk about setting up worker management joint occupational health and safety committee, also knowing that traditionally those lead to less conflictual worker management relations beyond the scope of health and safety. So that's that's one element. Uh, the other one is that we've got the right to refuse dangerous work with uh, an onus on um, the employer to prove that it's not dangerous and a collective right, so you can't replace somebody. Um, so I, those are, so there are a few elements uh, in there, as well as um, throughout the whole setting of the program um, under the agreement, we've looked at where are entry points for workers. So that's why, or uh, and this was heavily resisted by brands, uh, that the inspection reports are published with photos. And yeah, what you see on those photos are not only structural problems, for example, but also, well, quite ugly factories. And yeah, brands had an incentive not to, to show those, but okay, we did. Um, when there is then beef, when when workers have an issue, uh, there is an um, there is a, a complaints mechanism to which they can directly go, because an, uh, most of the issues of the workers are actually with the factories themselves, not necessarily with the brands, and so that's why there is a complaint me mechanism, and the brands are obliged to implement the consequences, the resolutions uh, of those. So I think it addresses the concern. Uh, if they really have then a beef with uh, a brand who hasn't implemented the terms of the agreement, well, there's also local unions who are signatory, so then we can do that. But most often it's really more about this factory is shifting uh, to another location. Well, we want those workers to go or to get, I don't know, a bus service to there because they have to move, right? It's more at that practical level, so either a space to get that solved at that level uh, under the the bigger uh, umbrella and also the, the sword of, of compliance hanging above that. So, um, and that's also transparent on, on, on the website. Um, the other remark, indeed, uh, I, I think it's an ongoing discussion, uh, should I leave or should I go? Um, but uh, in our taste, uh, brand counterparts are very, very much, no, no, let's finish the orders and then go. But I think what we try to introduce is consequence. In a number of, uh, and I, I can best speak about obviously my sector, uh, I, which I work in the textile sector, they, there's a reason that those factories are in countries with poor regulatory capacities. And so factory owners, 
but uh, it also goes when you talk about cotton, eh? I, uh, um, are not used by being told by a, a national regulator if they do something wrong that there is going to be consequence. It's more often more the opposite around. If, if you are a building inspector in Bangladesh and you tell a factory owner to close down because the building is unsafe, then most probably the building inspector will get fired. So that's not a consequence for the owner. And so I think at a given moment we need to uh, say that there is a number of things where we're very serious about. There's a, a few human rights risks that are so fundamental. And I think if you, if you start, uh, let's say workers want to exert their fundamental right to uh, join or form a union of their own choosing, and they get beaten up as a consequence of that, well, w what kind of, oh, let's, I, how far w would you then still stay there? At a given moment, you need to make sure that, listen, if you want to continue doing business with us, there is a minimum that you need to achieve. And, and giving that ID that inaction, non-compliance has consequences is often, in a lot of contexts, a novelty. And it's really about introducing that. And I think the, the approach, like, oh, no, we'll just ha leave it hanging there, these factory owners see through that. I, and they also know who is who. They, 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 they notice when the CSR responsible comes and say, oh, you don't have uh, clean toilets, or when the buying guy comes. And it's, it's really when the buying guy comes and says, well, I, I've heard of my CSR team, they're harassing me. If you don't do this, this, and this by that date, well, then, then we leave. And I think it's indeed about setting deadlines and respecting them. And I think that's where uh, often in practice the problem lies. If a, a brand needs to communicate, well, if you don't fix this by then, yeah, what happens? We'll leave. And then they have a fair chance. And I think it brings me to what, 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 what you said. Uh, indeed, how do we define risks? Um, it's, I, I fully agree with you, uh, the underlying sentiment of the question. I, I think in human rights due diligence, you do indeed do due diligence against something, against the stem standard, against human rights in this case. Um, so you also need to look at risks from that perspective and not necessarily uh, from a company perspective. I think that's, that's what maybe irritated me slightly with um, uh, the intervention of Geert, that for example, he mentioned um, uh, child labor in the garment sector. I wouldn't call that the biggest risk at this juncture in time. It's a risk that is, uh, that is indeed has a consumer element to it because consumers here in the West are easily mobilized on child labor. That's also why the, the sector has proven that it's capable if it really wants to get rid of a problem, it can actually get rid of because they were very aggressive on dealing with child labor consequence to the sweatshop movement in the 80s and the 90s. But I would call at this juncture in time falling buildings on, on workers' heads a, a far bigger risk. And that risk has always been sort of under dealt with compared um, um, to child labor. So indeed, I do think that the risk should be a human rights risk, not necessarily a, a consumer risk. And the moment that we let those IDs enter into the, into the picture, I think we're on the wrong track as a, a company. So I'll leave it at that so the others can also still respond. And to add another question into the mix, um, we have a question from the audience as well, if you want to. It's not a follow-up question. Though, it's follow is it for the other panelists? Sorry? Is it yeah, yeah, it's for perfect. the other Yeah, yeah. perfect, if you don't mind. Um, Lisbeth Anakin, Utrecht University. I have a question for Mr. Uh, Agnello. Um, I think f also for us in this project, I think one thing that's really uh, important, and I think you could have a, a, a better view of that than, for instance, I do, um, is, we're, so we're talking, we are talking, and also you in your report, as you indicate, are talking about um, perhaps stricter or extra responsibilities for EU-based companies um, in order to protect the human rights of non-EU-based citizens. And I would just like to hear your view on what is the current, what do you think of the current climate within the EU, not just in the European Parliament, but EU-wide, for these types of, uh, say, initiatives? Because, um, you know, in, in, in a broader sense, I think there is a little bit of a hostile climate <laughs> presently uh, um, towards the EU, uh, where a lot of people think they should stick to their core competences. Obviously, this is not one of the core competences if you talk about the EU as basically an economic organization uh, aimed at, at, at protecting its, its members' interests. So what would be your view on that, on uh, talking about the possibilities of a report uh, like you talking about or, or some of the recommendations that we, are, we have done? And if it's all right, 
We just add one element to it that's a little bit more on the question of who's covered by the own initiative report because there was quite a lot of debate before the vote in July about whether it would extend to EU registered companies and as well as EU based companies as well as for investors so whether it extends to pension funds and if you don't mind just touching on that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh complicated uh, question. Well, my perspective actually is not the perspective of the European Parliament, but of a committee specialized in human rights. Uh, why I say so? Because mm, the feeling is that when you deal with this kind of issue in specialized committee, I work also in DIVA, development issue. Well, uh, you can feel the differences among different political groups, but then uh, the maps, the member of the European Parliament that have choose to work on human rights or in development or farm, female rights, women rights, uh, okay, they have some perspective. So you can feel uh, a common, uh, let's say, background. They share more or less uh, some values. But when they come back to their own respective political groups, uh, the differences among the various groups are uh, stronger, of course. Uh, a member from the far right and a member from the far left that works in, uh, I don't know, uh, in com international commerce or international uh, trade or uh, in uh, um, defense issues, of course, uh, that have to vote in the plenary section too. Uh, have different feelings on human rights and these differences are stronger among these members than among the members of the same political groups working in uh, uh, um, human rights committee. So we will see what will happen in the, uh, in the plenary. Um, we, uh, we, 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 uh, I think that we, we have raised a good compromise that an high level uh, um, protection of human rights and um, strong words uh, and strong uh, um, you know, uh, tools. Uh, but for example, just to say, uh, some groups uh, was against the concept of uh, class action. So we maintained the reference to class action by expressly referring to the directive of the European Union, but we erased the word class section. So <laughs> we will see uh, what will happen in the plenary. Uh, so this is the European Parliament, but you ask me about the European Union. What can I say is that in 2012, uh, a proposal came by the Commission, including also the um, Forum Necessitatis, and this proposal uh, has been uh, vetoed by the parliament. So now it is a different legislature, but it seems that, and the commission is different, everything is different in the institutions. But mm, uh, according to this experience, the commission was ready to do some step forwards and the parliament uh, was, was blocking these steps. But maybe this time, I, I, I had no time to, 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 to afford also with this, but th what is this report? It's an INI report. Uh, it is an initiative report. So now uh, we have to push, and I talk also to the representative of the civil society that are here, we have to push together to the commission in order to make uh, that the commission itself uh, build a good proposal and then council and parliament uh, we work together for, for, for in order to raise this perspective. Um, but the Anini report uh, stresses what is the position of the parliament now. So it's important and also asks for action by the commission. So uh, I think that we are on the right road, uh, but now uh, the, the, the road is very long. <laughs> um, what about your question? I, I forgot. <laughs> Okay, okay, uh, okay. As I told you, uh, we were very strong uh, in this perspective. At the beginning, we would like to cover all the companies with a minimum linkage with the European Union. Also, for example, to have assets here, to be held by European company or to hold an European company, every kind of linkage, very, very broad. Of course, we faced some problem in uh, our relationship.
relationship with other groups on this point. And uh, now the report has uh, follow the, 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 the votation in the committee. Uh, well, still have some reference to third countries' companies, uh, but as, um, as I told you before, we have lost uh, the most clear paragraph on this point. So I think that in future, to the in our relation with the Commission, we can play by taking advantage of what has survived in the report of this, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> I used to be a researcher, I, I, do, I did a PhD in uh, international law, and when I wrote, I was very, you know, uh, very bad um, when commenting uh, normative uh, text because ah, this is unclear. This, but then when you <laughs> work into the machine and you know that you have to uh, put together uh, different uh, views and then this come to votes and with amendments some parts can be taken away, uh, you realize that uh, you are you have always holes in a test, but also uh, way, uh, you know, buttons to, pu to push to uh, raise some objective. So we will, we will try to, to, to put the, the ascent on this, on this during the next phase. Thank you. And I wanted to give Alice a chance to respond, but first, if there are any more questions, we started about 15 minutes late, so we have time for one or two last questions if there's anything in the audience or on Twitter. Um, and also I wanted to ask Peter uh, to give a little bit more information if I might because you mentioned that there's been some remedial action that's been taken and if you might just give an example of how Coca-Cola has worked with one of its suppliers um, about to deal with sort of issues that have been identified either on sugarcane or in other areas. Maybe another example which um to me was a bit surprising. Normally in our company we are dealing with unions and so in our case this is the IUF, the International Union of Food Industries. Um, and at a certain point in time um, we were also involved in a dialogue with um, building workers. And how does that came is because we, we obviously have a famous brand and we are sponsor of one of the global sport events being the World Cup football and there was a complaint um, through coming to the trade union association uh, to the sponsors of FIFA uh, to influence somehow uh, Qatar who has been chosen as organizing and the, um, the, the, the conditions under which those stadiums are built using a lot of migrant labor, using a lot of unsafe conditions, etc. So uh, at that time, uh, as multinational, we, yeah, we couldn't immediately solve that, but obviously we tried to talk to the other sponsors of uh, FIFA, try to convince them, and FIFA is a complex organization, as you know, um, with um, different ethical uh, rules, I think. <laughs> Um, but so it's uh, so it was an interesting debate to see how uh, you can still influence uh, a certain problem uh, in social uh, fields by pushing uh, this through, having the right meetings in place, and, and, and pushing it through. So as one example, because this was a bit oh, this was outside of scope, but this can happen. It's brand image. Uh, one maybe. Um, to your uh, comment, which is very relevant, do you think about the reputation of the people of the company or do you think about the people itself? Um, I think human rights and, and as lawyers, we all, it's all about risk management, yes? And what we do, um, obviously through a lot of regulations we are having, we, we have to do risk management, mainly seeing from a financial perspective. So then you are looking at reputation for the company but what we try to implement now and that's not always easy as the, the global human rights uh, workplace rights team in the coca-cola company is do that same exercise but think about risk to people and not only our own associates but the full supply chain and this is what we call salient human rights so we try to identify and then the the interesting exercise which we will do now is map those two. So see, okay, what comes out of our exercise, social, 
what comes out of the more, we call it enterprise risk management, uh, and, and try to map those two. So it's not, one is not excluding another, but it's important to make that distinction. And for people, it's uh, difficult to understand sometimes, yes. One very small um, comment uh, to build on, on that question. Um, if due diligence is a finished process, no. That's the answer, I think. And, and, and I think what is important to understand, and I'm sorry to stress a lot on this, but I, 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 I saw the, the impact of, of capacity building. So to move from simple due diligence and having uh, uh, suppliers data platforms where you log in the information to really say, okay, these are the issues. We come there, uh, or someone that knows well the, 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 the context comes there and, and deliver a training to understand, and a series of training, not just one off, to understand how to improve and to talk together, to discuss together how to improve. I think that's very important. I just wanted to say that. And are there any last remarks before we close up the panel? It's okay. Um, well, thank you very much for our, to our speakers for making the time to join us today. It was incredibly interesting, and I think you highlighted the practical challenges associated with putting together a risk management process, but also dealing with the sort of the, the social angle, which is not always doesn't always materialize in a, a legal risk management framework. Um, and I think the question, the point that was made by Peter about. Um, the, needing to ask the question, how deep do we want to look into the supply chains is a critical one. We see that now with the conflict minerals regulation, which Amnesty International and others have been working on and will hopefully see adopted into law by the end of the year, where it's very limited and the question of how far should we go in um, is perhaps not being addressed satisfactorily. Um, we'll adjourn now for lunch, which apparently is being provided, and um, we'll meet back here in the room at promptly at 2 o'clock to start into the afternoon session. So if you don't mind just joining me in thanking the panelists.